Hold on. Okay. Hello again, everyone. I am Chris Sherwood. This is the Citizen Sports Weekly for Friday, April 23rd, 2021. Robert Harding and Justin Ritzel are with me. It's been an exciting Friday. I got my second COVID shot earlier today. I feel great. Uh, no side effects yet. Knock on wood. We'll see how I feel in a few hours. But right now, I'm, I'm rip raring to go. So we got some great sports topics that uh, Robert came up with. Our first one, of course, the NFL. Uh, they had some uh, rule changes uh, over the past few days. And uh, one of them was the influence of replay officials. And they can now offer advice on, uh, on things uh, such as areas of possession, whether a pass was completed or intercepted, the location of the ball, and whether the player was down by contact. And again, these are great things because I've always been a proponent of replay. This dates back to the 80s, back when the NFL first started instant replay in 1986. I remember it very well. The idea is to get the call right. And anything you can do to hasten that or, you know, make ensure that, that is what you want to do. I have no issue with replay when it gets it right. Now, if they look at it and they still can't get it right, well, then, okay, what can you do? I mean, these things do happen sometimes. But irregardless, I love replay. Get the call right. Make sure it's done right. And that, make sure the right team, uh, you know, gets the benefit of the call. Robert, your thoughts on the rule changes? I think it's a typical NFL. It's a, it's a half measure. It's, it's a little bit better than what it was before, but they didn't really make any sort of radical change that, you know, really uh, would have improved the replay process. Uh, you know, it, it's, this is a trend with the NFL, uh, especially uh, in regard to replay. They like to experiment with things. They like to, you know, take these kind of half measures but don't really commit to anything that would, uh, you know, again, be, be radical enough to really maybe make some changes that uh, are not only much needed, but could uh, vastly improve the, the replay process. You know, I think that this is, uh, you know, it'll certainly help out, I think, with, with the process, but, uh, you know, I think it was the head of the competition committee who said that they weren't comfortable with the idea of giving a, a, a you know, that kind of official authority to, you know, someone in the booth. And I think that's just a mistake. I mean, the, the technology is available to you. Why not use it? Uh, and, and, you know, some sports have been better at this than others. You know, I, I think a tennis, you know, they use, uh, I mean, they've really had to use this technology a lot because of COVID uh, and, you know, relying on, uh, you know, the, um, you know, electronic trackers, so to speak, uh, to determine whether a ball is in, in or out. You know, obviously that's a, a bit of a simpler game. You don't have a lot of subjective calls there, but, you know, I think that the NFL is just making a mistake here by, by not going completely in the direction that they should, giving that replay official a little more authority so that uh, you can change some errors, big or small, you know, on the fly and, uh, you know, protect the integrity of the game, make sure that uh, various calls don't, uh, you know, uh, you know, affect the outcome and go from there. Um, hopefully the NFL, you know, keeps looking at uh, ways to improve replay instead of being stubborn. I think, you know, the, this idea of a sky judge, the reason that they're not signing on to that is that it wasn't their idea. So they, they they're, you know, they're reluctant to go that far, uh, but it is a good idea. And, you know, the, swiftness of those replay reviews, I believe in the XFL was something that impressed me. It would be a good idea for the NFL, but here we are. Justin. Yeah, you know, it seems like uh, it's what the second time in two weeks, three weeks that we've talked about replay in professional sports. Uh, I've just reached a point with replay where uh, I'm just, I, I don't think it's, it's ever going to be completely satisfactory. I think we're always going to be pissing and moaning about a call that gets missed or, you know, we've, we've seen, like we talked about a couple of weeks with, with MLB that even as major league baseball has expanded replay, we're still getting umpires get a second look at plays and they're still getting it wrong. So I think just the era that we live in with all this technology and all these cameras, you know, NFL games, there's, there's 30 cameras uh, at all points of the, you know, uh, all areas of the field, we've just opened up a can of worms where 
Uh, our expectations are because of the technology that 100% of the calls should be right. They should be correct. And that's just unrealistic. So I'm just kind of at a point where I just, I wish it was like 2004 when there was X, you know, there was access to a certain level of replay, but it didn't feel like it always dominated the conversation because the technology 15, 16, 17 years ago, isn't what it was, uh, what it is today. So, um, so that's kind of where I'm at is I'm just resigned to the fact that uh, we keep trying to come up with solutions as Robert, Robert put it a lot of half measures. And I just can't wait till September rolls around and uh, the first controversial call happens that doesn't get right. And we're just back at square one. It just seems like uh, a wheel that will never break, you know, uh, and then I, I just wanted to say, as far as uh, if I read this right, Robert sent out the, the link to the ESPN story. So they're going to try, um, instead of uh, necessarily having to do onside kicks, they're going to give teams the option of doing like a, a fourth and 15. No, I don't think that option. passed. I don't think that passed. I think what passed was the passed. onside kick. The it says one, approved as one year experiment. I thought they did something with the, the players have to be a certain a distance back or something where you can't have like nine, you can't have a certain number of guys really close to the, to the line there. You have to have some of them back a little bit. So that way there's, there's fewer players that can receive the ball. Um, I think they should have some type of neutral zone or something. Just have like an area where uh, nobody can be. And then you can literally just put the ball right there and whoever gets to it first gets it. But, you know. Um, yeah. The, the I, rule I, is, the, the rule is that uh, the, this year, the, this one-year experiment that, that Ritz was talking about, the receiving team on kickoffs will be limited to nine players within 25 yards of the ball. Because yeah. what usually happens is the receiving team, maybe they put one guy back, but they'll put 10 players and they, you know, they tend to be on the side of the ball uh, that, um, that it looks like the, the opposing team is going to kick to. Uh, and so you, you know, you end up with a bit of an advantage there. You guys, you can have that front line that kind of blocks and then, you know, that frees up the, uh, the receiving team. You know, I, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. I don't think it'll do much because of just how teams have strategized against that, but it'll be interesting to see what they do with it. But again, another, another half measure, you know, let's not do anything radical. Let's try to do this, uh, you know, little experiment that, you know, who knows whether that'll change anything or not. I, I kind of wish what they would do with the onside kicks is, um, you know, because the reason they that onside kicks have been so, you know, absent really that they're so hard to convert is because what you don't really get the running start. Like you're kind of yeah. players who are trying to retrieve the ball are kind of limited and in, in getting ahead of steam. I remember there was, what was it, 2019? There was a, I think it was like the Thanksgiving night game between the Falcons and the Saints. And Falcons had to like, retrieve consecutive onside kicks and they somehow did it. They got two straight after the whole season, no one could get it. So it can be done, but it's so rare. I kind of wish what they would do because ultimately what's happened is the NFL doesn't want those running starts because uh, you know, for safety measures on, on normal kickoffs, I kind of wish they would just say, Hey, if you want to do an onside kick, we will allow you the running. Yes. But you have to declare that you are doing an onside kick. And if you kick the ball past, you know, 20 yards, 30 yards, it's a penalty or something like that. That way you, you know, you know, onside kicks, they're only, you know, they might happen once a game. So you're not really adding too much, you know, repeated uh, chance at injury, but you're increasing the chances of, of one being recovered. Uh, I, I would I hate to see like the, Eagle, the Eagles propose like the, the fourth and 15 from your own 25. The way the teams are able to pass now, like a fourth and 15 for like the Chiefs or the Packers, that is not, you know, out of the ordinary for them to complete a, a play like that. So, or a cheap pass or a You know, because that's, you know, what's going to happen. You're going to have some team throw the ball and hope they get a penalty for pass interference. Next thing you know, they got a first down. That's the issue. With, that's the biggest issue with the fourth and 15. It's a gimmick, it's almost like an MLB type of thing. And, oh, and to be fair go. to to be fair to NFL, like it's not like it's not like Major League Baseball or the NHL, where like if we want to try a radical rule change, well, we have like minor leagues to kind of guinea pig it. Like like with the uh, Atlantic League is trying to, you know, they're going to move the mound back a little bit. 
you know, major league baseball has the advantage of saying, Hey, minor leaguers, you know, cause ultimately you guys, you know, aren't as important quote unquote, you guys can experiment. We'll see how it goes. We'll use your players to, to try it out and, and not expose our players, you know, the, the, prof- you know, the, uh, the major leaguers to, to do this. And we'll see if it works that way. The NFL obviously doesn't have that advantage because uh, what are you going to tell college football, how to, how to do their thing? Uh, that, that probably wouldn't go over so well. So in their defense, you know, they don't have that, that guinea pig system. Well, speaking of MLB, our next topic is the New York Yankees, the team that was expected to be the top team in the American League this season. They're off to their worst start in, 19, in 30 years. In 1991, back when I was a Yankee fan, I remember those days, uh, the Yankees had the worst record in all of Major League Baseball in 1990. They got the number one draft pick in 91. Picked Brian Taylor, who was supposed to be the greatest, one of the greatest pitching prospects in history. And of course, the following year, he got into a fight and screwed up his shoulder, and he never really did anything of consequence ever again. So I remember those dreadful Yankee teams of the early 90s, of which, uh, you know, obviously they built Gene Michael, built the uh, World Series team in the late 90s. So what is going on with the Yankees? Okay, there's a lot of things. First of all, and we've discussed this before, guys. To me, the Yankees are the epitome of modern baseball. It's all analytics. It's all about launch trajectories. It's all about hitting home runs, okay? And I get the Yankees have always been the Bronx Bombers. I get that, okay? And I'm not saying they need to play small ball, okay? But when you have a team that's full of sluggers, basically it's homers or nothing, this is what happened. And then you add on a manager who, again, and I've said it from day one, should not be the manager. He never managed a day in the minor leagues or a day in the major leagues. I don't think he ever coached in the major league. This Aaron Boone is so unqualified, it's not even funny, okay? I mean, this is what happens when you have an unqualified manager having to deal with, like, you know, his, his, his great bombers or, or sluggers with it all the time. He can't, he can't fix it, okay? So, to me, the Yankees need to make some changes at the top. I think Brian Cashman should feel some heat, too. I mean, look, he's been the GM now for, for over 20 years. He's basically developed, he's only developed one World Series title, okay? And he basically bought that one with Teixeira and Sabathia, okay? I mean, he's riding off the coattails of Gene Michael and Bob Watson from the early 90s, mid-90s into the, you know, 96, 97. So I think Cashman's rear end should be on the line. And I'll say this finally, if George Steinbrenner, the boss was still alive, oh, you better believe there'd be some, some bodies, some, some heads being taken off right now. He wouldn't be standing for this. No way. It's, it's just dead what's going on with the Yankees. Now, that being said, I think they can get they can overcome this and, and get back on top of the American League East again. But this just shows you like when when, you know, a few guys aren't hitting the home runs and they're whiffing more than usual. This is the problem. So go ahead, Justin, your thoughts on the Yanks. I'll tell you what, you know. I wish I had a crystal ball because I, I swear I could have told you exactly what Chris was going to say in regards to the Yankees. <laughs> blaming analytics, oh, blaming, blaming, blaming Aaron Boone because, you know, he's been saying since day one that Aaron Boone is a terrible manager. He was a terrible choice. Listen, the Yankees have made the playoffs every year. Aaron Boone has been the manager. They were in the ALCS a couple years ago. They lost to the eventual AL champs last year, the Rays. So let's not act like this is some team that's, that's missing yeah. the playoffs. By have they gotten to the World Series yet? Have they gotten to the World Series yet? Okay, no. Getting to the World Series is difficult, no. Chris, and this is like his third year, you know? No, I'm, look, look, the Yankees went, went to the World Series how many times with Joe Torre? Like five, six times, okay? I'm No, I'm sorry. Even even Girardi got to one and won it. For, I give him a little credit. Now, Aaron Boone should not be managed. How, how long was Girardi the manager? Jerry was the manager for what, about 10 years? And he made the World Series once with the yeah. highest payroll in baseball. Okay, it's, it's difficult to make the World Series. I, but I, I, I do think you're onto something, Chris. I think Brian Cashman absolutely should be feeling the hot seat because I look at the Yankees. Their problem isn't Aaron Boone. Their problem isn't this analytics revolution. Their problem is they can't pitch. And every single year, uh, past, past Garrett Cole, who's now been, you know, he's in his second year with the Yankees. Every year, their second through fifth starter is a total toss-up. I look at their, their rotation right now. Garrett Cole, he's a stud, but they took a chance on Corey Kluber, who's pitched like two innings in two years coming into this year. Uh, Jamison Taon from the, from the Pirates, they acquired him coming off elbow injuries. Uh, you're taking these like wild-card pitchers 
that you don't know if they're going to make it 50 innings, let alone a whole season. And uh, not surprisingly, they've struggled early in the season. So that's what it comes down to me is that Brian Cashman doesn't know how to build a rotation. Uh, I remember, you know, four or five years ago when the Yankees were talked about as like having this, this deep prospect pool, the best prospect pool in baseball. And what happened? Well, they traded a lot of those prospects for, uh, you know, John Carlos Stanton's of the world. And where's it gotten them? Uh, Stanton's been a disappointment. Now their prospect pool isn't as good. And here they are. But listen, it's April. They're only seven and 11. Uh, it's not like they're a one win yeah. team. Uh, you look over at Oakland and that team was, I'm looking at the standings right now. Uh, Oakland was one and seven to start the season. And they went on, they're currently on an 11 game winning streak in their first in the AL West. So uh, it's early. Uh, I wouldn't say it's out of the realm of possibility that the Yankees turn this around and turn this around soon. Uh, the Red Sox are in first place. Uh, no one saw that coming. The AL East is still a very winnable division. I think the Yankees will be right there in the end, but uh, they got to start pitching. That's what it's going to come down to is they can't just have a, a one man rotation because on them so far. Robert? Well, let me first uh, say that, uh, you know, I put this uh, topic in here as bait because yeah. as, as Ritz pointed out, Shira's response was predictable. You know, like the old men he used to get together with and drink coffee at McDonald's whining about baseball. I mean, this guy was texting me last night complaining really? about the runner on second rule. I mean, what, you know, That's we have a purist lame. on this. On Lane, this uh, show, Jimmy. ladies and gents, uh, so, you know, not shocking that analytics and Aaron Boone are to blame for the Yankees' woes. Um, you know, I did pull up Aaron Boone's uh, record, and, you know, I Ritz covered it, I think, pretty well. But, you know, the Yankees have won 100 games uh, in two of the, the three the past three seasons with uh, Boone as skipper. So I don't think he's going to be fired anytime soon. I get that the the New York City crowd, you know, Shira's radio pals there are up in arms. But, you know, as Ritz said, it is it is April. A lot can change. Uh, I'm wearing a uh, shirt here, the Nationals. They won the World Series two years ago. And if you went off of their performance in April and May, you would have said, oh, this team's a dumpster fire. There were calls then for uh, Davey Martinez to be fired. And look at look at them now. They're, they're not going to fire that guy anytime soon. So it's I do, yes. yeah. So I do think a point that Ritz raised is, is, is important and that's the pitching and, you know, whether you hold Cashman accountable, you know, whomever it is, uh, the pitching has been a problem and it's been a longstanding problem. You know, this team has the bats. There's no question about it. You know, Stanton has his injuries. Uh, Judge has his injuries, but there's plenty of other, good players on this team, you know, in terms of the offense that have produced over the years, but the pitching has been the biggest weakness. Uh, Garrett Cole can only do so much. He only starts every fifth day. Uh, yeah. When you get to the playoffs, maybe you see him a little bit more and, you know, he can help you, but um, you know, he needs help. You know, you need better, uh, a better staff, uh, some better starters. The, the other starters aren't producing this year uh, and you need a better bullpen, quite frankly. Uh, so, you know, that's really what's been holding the Yankees back from really getting to that, uh, to that uh, level where they're competing for, you know, a World Series and making it out of the AL, winning the pennant, and going on to face the likes of the Dodgers, for example. Uh, so, you know, I think if I'm a Yankees fan, what I say is, you know, let's, let's relax here, to, to borrow a uh, quote from Ritz's favorite quarterback, relax, you know. There's plenty of time here. Plenty of teams have turned it around. And look, you know, there, there have been examples over the years of teams that get hot to start the season and then they crumble, you know, in the last few months of the season. So, you know, it's, it's too early to make any sort of judgments about the state of the MLB. But, man, was it – it was predictable. I just knew it when I put this topic on here that Shira was going to go – all, you know, it's like week one of the NFL season. Oh, fire Brian Flores. I mean, that's exactly what this is. Let's awesome. relax. The Yankees will be fine. Okay. All right. Our last topic, back to the NFL. Uh, this coming Thursday, it's it's like Christmas for us. It's the NFL draft. We, we look forward to this. We all love the draft. We, 
we, we eat it up and everything. So, um, so the last topic is who do you think our teams, and that's the Bills for Robert and the Packers for Justin, and of course, my Miami Dolphins, are going to pick in the first round. So my team has two first round picks, um, and they have the number six and the number 18 selection. So at number six, I really hope they get Kyle Pitts, the tight end out of Florida. Okay, I really want this guy to be a Dolphin. I'm, I'm going to be really, really bothered if they don't get him with the number six pick. Because again, remember, they had the number three pick traded back with the Niners back to 12 and traded back up to six with the Eagles. They could have stayed at three. They would have had fits. No problem. Um, you know, you can say whatever you want about overdrafting a player. I don't care about that. That gobbledygook to me, if you think a guy is that good and can make a difference on your team, you pick them no matter whether it's number one, two, three, four, whatever. So I hope they get fits with the first one for number 18. Look, I, I want, I want a good running back. And I think Najee Harris is the best running back in the draft. And I'd like to see the dogs pick him at 18. That being said, I wouldn't be upset if they did not pick a running back at 18. If they picked an edge rusher, like uh, there's some guy out of Miami, Penn State, and look, just pick a pick a good edge rusher, okay, at number 18. If you don't pick a running back, and you could pick a running back at the beginning of the uh, of the second round, there maybe still get a good one. So you know, I just want Pitts. I want Pitts. If we don't get Pitts, obviously Jamar Chase, the great wide receiver out of Louisville, maybe Waddle. I'm not a big Devontae Smith fan because I'm sorry, the kid is too small. Okay. And I get, you can't always go by size and everything. Okay. Whatever. But that kid, I, I mean, look, he's 160 pounds. Okay. I weigh more than 160 pounds. Okay. You're not going to see me playing in the NFL wide receiver. Even, even, you know, even if I had that type of speed, I'm sorry. You need some size. Maybe the kid gains some weight, lifts some weights, whatever, you know, he's, he's, he's really big during the summertime, put some pounds on. I want to see the kid do well, but I just hope the Dolphins don't pick them. But it'll be interesting to see what happens. Go ahead, Robert. Your Buffalo Bills, who are they picking in the first round? Well, first, I mean, you know, oh, for boy. you to say that about Devontae Smith, I mean, listen, uh, you have uh, plenty of Chick-fil-A padding on that body. Uh, oh. And I think, you know, you at whatever you weigh, uh, you know, couldn't take a hit. But Devontae Smith can. And, uh, you know, I think his speed – I think he will be a fine NFL receiver, uh, probably with his skill set, the best out of this class, quite frankly. Uh, for the Bills, you know, there's there's a lot of talk about, you know, a few different positions. Uh, I know running back comes up because, you know, it's a late first round pick. You know, it's not a higher pick where, you know, maybe you think about, you know, some different value at that position. You know, if one of those uh, running backs are there. You know, you mentioned Najee Harris. Obviously, he's really the cream of the crop. Uh, you know, you got the kid out of Clemson. You got some other kids there uh, uh, in, that could go in the second and third round. Um, you know, I think with those, you, can, you kind of have to weigh your decision there. Uh, if running back means that much to you, uh, and I think for the Bills offense, it's really the missing piece, maybe you use a first round pick. Uh, but I think that they'll they'll go on the defensive side of the ball. I think they they definitely could use an edge rusher. One of the complaints about this team last year was that uh, they lacked uh, in a lot of games, especially against some of the better quarterbacks. Uh, they lacked that pressure, you know, getting getting into the quarterback, even if you're not going to get a sack, at least applying that pressure. Uh, so uh, that's going to be a big one. And corner, you know, the the number two corner spot on this team, uh, they. They had kind of corner by committee last year, uh, this uh, platoon with Josh Norman and Levi Wallace. Uh, I think Wallace is serviceable. Uh, he's going to be back next year or this coming season. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think finding a, a guy who can come in and be a, a stud number two, which there's going to be plenty of talent there. Uh, maybe Caleb Farley, for example, falls to them. That would be a gift uh, if, if that happens. Uh, but, you know, as far as running backs go, because I, I, I sense that Ritz might have something to say on this, but as far as running backs go, there's some good running backs that are going to be available in this draft in the later rounds. So you have to weigh that decision. You know, there's some guys that, uh, uh, you know, have a lot of talent, can come in and be really good NFL running backs who aren't anywhere close to a first rounder. They might be third, fourth, fifth round maybe even later. Uh, so I think you have to weigh that when you're thinking about the needs of your team, 
and whether a running back is, is something that you desperately need. I think in the Bills case, you know, they have a pretty potent offense, you know, with or without a, a stud running back, but maybe they feel that it would make them even better if they had someone that dynamic. Uh, if that's the case, use your first rounder on them. But again, there's a lot of talent left there. Uh, so, you know, I think you have to choose wisely when it comes to the draft and running backs because of that talent pool that could go anywhere between, uh, you know, I think the third to the seventh round even. Justin, who are the Packers going to pick? Well, first, I want to say, since you both mentioned running backs in the first round, which is a total draft no-no for me, uh, it's basically the number two draft no-no. Uh, number one would be don't draft a quarterback when you have a Hall of Fame quarterback who's about to win his third MVP. Uh, that's that's number one on the list of don't do uh, don't do it in the first round. But um, listen, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Warren Sharp. He's kind of a football analytics guy, but uh, he posted an interesting stat the other day as far as um, how frequently each position uh, when drafted in the first round, how frequently teams pick up those players' fifth-year option, which basically means, you know, how many, how often do you draft a certain position? Do a team feel they want to invest in that guy past their rookie deal? Uh, because when I think of first round picks, that's a guy that not only do I want to get four or five good years out of on their rookie contract, but that's a player I want to invest a second contract in that they're going to be around seven, eight years. And I'm sorry, but the running back position is just too, uh, too injury prone for me. You see the tread come off the tires at that position too quickly. Uh, too many first round running backs have either uh, not been brought back by their original team or team sign them to second contracts that they immediately regret. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott comes to mind, uh, a guy who was looked like the best running back in football three years ago, while now Cowboys fans can't wait to get rid of him. Todd Gurley, he's going to be on what, his third team? I don't even think he has a team right now. Um, he was with the Falcons last year and looked like, you know, looked like an old man. He looked like Shearer running the ball out there. Um, so I would advise any team, do not draft the running back in the first round. Uh, there's too many good running backs in the league right now that were taken later. Alvin Kamara, Aaron Jones, Derrick Henry was a second rounder. Uh, don't do it. It's stupid. It's a bad investment. Now, Chris, like you said, draft day is often like Christmas day for us. And as I alluded to last year, draft day was anything, but <laughs> you got hole in your stocking. <laughs> so at this point, I've been saying this, the worst thing the Packers could do they already did. They did it last year when they took a quarterback, when they had a team that's trying to win a Super Bowl. Uh, so honestly, I'm just going to sit back this year and I'm just going to hope that they take the best player available. Hopefully it's not a running back, um, whether that's offensive lineman, which I've been saying I thought they should have taken last year while everyone else was, was saying they needed a wide receiver. I wanted an offensive lineman. Offensive success starts in the trenches. You got to block to be successful consistently. So I would take a tackle. Uh, if they want to go wide receiver, that's fine with me. Uh, I, I think there's a good value in the second round at that position. Uh, and then cornerback. Uh, if I have to watch Kevin King give up a Hail Mary at halftime during an NFC championship against, uh, you know, whoever next year, I think I might just watch, stop watching football. Uh, so a cornerback, uh, I would gladly accept as well. But uh, listen, no one ever got upset when a team just took the best player on the board. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm hoping the Packers do. They don't really have like a glaring weakness, um, you know, like Chris's Dolphins do. No. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you know, this is what I just love about this video, guys. You just jump on, jump on, you know, just pile on Chris. Oh, Chris drinking coffee at McDonald's. So, gold so, so what happens when the Dolphins don't get Kyle Pitts? Are you going to cry about it for oh, the next I'm not going to cry. I'm going to be. I'm going to be a little angry because again, you could have had him. Now, maybe, what happens maybe if a he'll... suspicious video of Kyle Pitts in a, you know, yeah, I was going to say the, the Larry Tunsil uh, video reduce point. Oh, that would be fun. So. You know, I, there was, there was an argument to be made. Uh, I've seen this that Laramie Tunsil is the best non quarterback draft pick of the last five years, just because of all the value the Dolphins got out of trading him. Yeah. I mean, well, look, that was a great trade and, and, Thank you, Bill O'Brien. You know, that was the, the gift that just keeps on giving. And you got to give Chris Beer credit. He's definitely maximized his assets. But now he's got to pick players that contribute and uh, make this team better because, you know, you, you won 10 games. And, uh, I, you know, I can, I can say that it was a little bit of a fluke 
10 win season because, and you guys have said this, they got some defensive touchdowns that if you don't get those, maybe you don't win some of those games. That, and that's not going to necessarily happen again this year. We can talk about this later on during the off season, but um, the Dolphins need to get players. They're going to make an impact, whether it's pass rusher, whether it's a wide receiver, a tight end, whatever, offensive weapons. Two has got to take the next step. Uh, a lot is a lot of pressure on him for season number two. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. So, all right, gentlemen, it's been fun as always, even though you have been, um, you know, ripping on me and everything, but I guess that's part for the course. I'm used to it. So, uh, but it's been fun. Uh, next week um, we'll be, I guess we'll be doing maybe a little more draft stuff. But we'll be back on Wednesday. So we'll do a little more of a draft preview, maybe Robert, um, you know, or maybe we'll wait and do it on next Friday and we can, uh, look back at the first round possibly we'll have to make a decision about that well i'm a i'm a flexible guy you know you, and, yeah. you know i i i go off of uh ritz's schedule if he's if he's busy with high school sports we don't interfere with that uh we can do it on friday either way i'm sure we'll be talking about the draft uh you know he's he's fresh off a triple overtime game yeah. that was quite a, a fun one one of our most read stories on auburnpub.com by the way so a lot of interest in that. So uh, we try to keep this video uh, away from the high school beat uh, so that Ritz is free to, uh, to do that great work. So. Yeah, kudos. Well, thanks. Thanks. I, 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 hope, uh, I hope people tune in though, because next week is the start of spring sports, yeah. uh, which I am really looking forward to. It's been almost two years since I've covered baseball or lacrosse. I know those kids, you know, they've been waiting patiently to get back on the field and compete. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to that. That starts next next week. Those kids have been waiting patiently. Um, so let's hope for a great, great spring season. All right, guys. It's been great. Folks, thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next week.